everybody, it's Mark Matthews. This is the start of the workshop. It's going to kick off in about two minutes here. So I'm just going to give you guys a um, rundown on what we're going to go through in this workshop exactly. So thank you for joining. It's been awesome having everyone like so engaged in the very first one. I did a Q&A a couple weeks ago, and now we're into the second one. So I'm really excited to present this to you and teach you all the things you need to know about how to become sponsored, some tools that will really help you, and all that sort of fun stuff. So before we kick off in one minute here, I'm going to go over kind of what the schedule is for the workshop here. And just one thing, all of you guys are just in listening mode, so you can't actually like talk back to me. But if you go to the questions tab on the um, platform here, you'll see there's like a tab that says questions. Open that up and you can type any question to me. You can ask each other questions, ask me a question, and I'll get back to you right away as we're going through all this. So here is the main five items I went over in the first workshop, these folders at the top here. I talked about your skill building and your training, so like basically how to practice and train on your bike and some techniques that cross over to a few other sports too, like different things you should be trying to do, um, just like some nutritional, <laughs> even like nutritional based tips and all that sort of stuff. And then I went into like how to network as an ambassador, like how to meet people in your industry that are going to help you out and help you get to build those connections, which will ultimately help you get sponsorships. And three, like building social media, personal brand and all that sort of stuff. These three things I'm going to touch on today the most. And then we're going to go back into um, how to really acquire sponsorships. But rather than focusing on every element of that, like we did in workshop number one, I'm going to teach you how to build like a pitch deck or a resume. And we're going to show you how to do that using Bubble Up because I've found a really clean, simple way to make pitch decks that have been quite successful for me. So I have an example here of one I did for Kuat Racks just like two months ago. And they were like really impressed with this pitch deck. And I actually got a sponsorship because of it. We're working out a deal right now. So it's a really good example. And then um, discover your talent. That was a pretty broad subject that I'm not really going to go into this time. We're going to be more focused on these first three and then how to build a pitch deck using a role. That's going to be kind of the main focus for, for the workshop today. So yeah, one, just to reiterate, because I have no questions yet, just so everyone knows how to use the go-to webinar here. You are in listening mode, so you can't speak back to me but you can answer, I can answer any questions you type to me. So if you look at the questions tab on the platform here, you can see there's a question and an asker, and then I will be able to, you can send it to all or send it to me privately, and I can get back to your question right away. Okay, so let's jump into the first category again on some tips on how to be sponsored. All right, so if you look in here, I have, Oh, someone was able to add their own folder into this, so I, I need to change those permissions. But um, I talked about these main key notes. So we're just going to go over these notes for, for this workshop specifically. So some of the takeaway points when it comes to progressing was on your bike, whatever sport you're doing. I'm using mountain biking as an example because I'm a mountain biker. I'm sure many of you are. But some of the like ways that you approach this in terms of like breaking down skills is really important. So one thing that it's really important for me to tell you is that like patience is key with all of this. I have like so many people message me and ask me like how to do a trick or a skill. They get frustrated right away because they've been trying for like maybe a week or a month and they can't figure it out. And a big thing I get asked is like, how do I feel comfortable in the air, like on bigger jumps or like more aggressive terrain or anything that's more difficult where I'm going bigger on my bike, I always feel scared. And I get this question a lot of the time. And it's because you need to be patient and build up skills like one little baby step at a time. I use the example of like what a progression ladder would look like for learning a 360 tail whip. That's a really big trick where you're like doing a 360 in the air on a jump and throwing a tail whip. And I was kind of thinking to myself like, okay, how did I learn that trick? And I'm still not that consistent with it because I haven't done it that many times in the last few years. But I have actually had like a long time to really work on it. And it was like such a mission and like such a big project to learn. So here's kind of the breakdown of how you would learn something that advanced. 
So number one, first you want to get comfortable like on like rollers and like easy terrain where you have bike control, you're standing up on your bike, you're pumping, you're learning how to carry speed and you're learning how to hit like small tabletop jumps. So that would be like the very beginning step to learning how to jump. Number two would be actually learning how to get comfortable in the air, even on like the smallest jumps. Cause like getting that feeling of lifting your tires in the air and touching back down is really gonna be like the base for everything that involves jumping. Just like that comfort level is super important to build up. The number three is learning how to hit gap jumps. The most <laughs> intimidating looking jumps there are because there's bigger consequence if you come up short. And th this is like, something that's a mental game too but you really have to get comfortable with learning gap jumps so even these first three steps here like that could be like a six month window and then you get to bigger jumps and start learning basic tricks and then you start learning beginner slope style tricks which are actually like more advanced regular tricks like taking off your feet in the air kicking them off to the side in an open can can taking your hands off in the air there's all those tricks that will still probably take you like up to a year to learn if you're really like hard on like learning how to jump. And then after that is the more advanced tricks like the 360 and the tail whip. Both of those tricks could take you like a year or two to learn alone. So maybe you're at like three years now. And then to combine these two tricks, like for me, it took like, oh man, like I remember when I worked at the Air Dome in Whistler and there was the foam pit there. And I, I practiced like every single day for like three months before they started working properly and that's every single day of practice with like no consequence set a foam pit to go into so on a real jump it would be a lot harder okay i'm going to answer a couple questions here right as we start hey so i missed the first webinar um is this more geared to people striving to become a pro athlete um or is it more useful for someone to be wanting to be make social media okay um it's going to be for both so i'm starting off with some of the things that it takes to actually learn how to be a pro level athlete, like some of the practicing that's involved and like how that kind of looks and kind of the timeline around that. That's kind of the intro here. But then I'm gonna break into like how to network, how to build your personal brand, a lot of social media tips. And then I'm gonna like in implement those tips into creating a pitch deck that you can do here on Bubble Up. And I'm gonna show you how you actually do that and implement it. So yeah, we're gonna cover everything here in the next hour. This is just the intro. One more question from Michael. Out of curiosity, if I case a gap jump, should I double down or take a break for a while? Um, I would say like, if you like, it depends on like, obviously you can case jumps all the time within your limit. It's just like a mistake where you're not landing smoothly or you're misjudging speed a bit. But if the gap jump that you did case feels like way out of your skill level and you kind of did it to really scare yourself and you cased it, you crashed hard, if that was the case, I would say definitely dial it down a bit, go to smaller jumps and get a lot more comfortable in the air before you go back up to that level. But if it's just like you cased it, you got back up, you didn't get hurt and you're comfortable trying again, then definitely try again. Cause that's the number one way to progress and get to that next level is um, pushing yourself and being a little scared, but within your skill level. Like if you can be, if you can like kind of balance that fear and skill level, at the right spot, then that's really gonna help push you in like a really safe way still, but it's like getting that mental breakthrough is huge. So have I always been interested in cycling at a young age or to get into it as I got older? I've always kind of loved it as like, um, I guess like around age 12, 13, I kind of started riding bikes, but I didn't start like getting into like doing jumps and starting to do tricks and downhill riding until about age 14, 15, I really got into it. So I really wasn't that young. A couple more questions are popping up, but I'm gonna just power through this first thing here. So, and one thing you really need to learn, so, okay, I just talked about how it like could literally take over three years to learn one single like advanced trick. So it's a long time. And the second point is set aside time to practice. So if you wanna be a professional, mountain biker, if you want to learn those skills, like you need to put in the hours. I, I put in a rough number of 30 hours a week on the bike, which is a lot, but the people I know who are some of the best in the world, like, especially if you look at the slope style athletes who are really training hard, that's more my world than downhill because when I was younger, I competed in slope style. So guys like Brett Reeder, Brandon Semenov, 
um, all the top slope style athletes, like the guys who have won the most, they do put that much work into riding their bikes. Like they're in there 30 plus hours a week, every day for hours at a time, they're out there practicing and they're always, they're always riding their bikes. They're always pushing it. And they're working really, really hard. Like this isn't like pure talent. Like a lot of, a lot of this involved is hard work. Like you've got to work really hard. You've got to be on the bike a lot and you've got to make the sacrifices to do it. Like for, I have an example in here of myself, how I worked like temporary landscaping jobs. I would get like fired from landscaping jobs all the time. So I would leave for like almost a week and go to a bike event and come back and find another kind of crappy job. And that's what I would do. And I would make riding like my number one kind of priority. And I sacrificed kind of everything for riding for like almost a decade. And it was, it was like a lot of fun, but also like I was broke. It wasn't easy, but it was a really fun challenge. And I was doing what I loved and I was able to carry that into a career eventually just by making that sacrifice and that commitment to it. Um, one more thing too, is make sure you ride with friends. Uh, this is what's really going to help you. Like, especially with like pushing each other and learning, like there's no better way to learn something than ride with friends. You should, you want to be surrounded by people better than you too. So like, when I was younger, like eight years ago, I moved in with a couple friends who were sponsored riders. And that was really cool because hanging out with them also helped me build connections to get sponsorships. But riding with them also helped me like with um, learning how to like, like really push myself because they would make me do stuff I wouldn't on my own. So riding with friends is really important. Another cool thing is, even if you don't have friends like this to ride with, but you want to attract people like this into your circle, a cool thing to do is like create your own riding community, build your own trails and attract people to come ride in areas where you are. Because if like, say you build a really cool set of jumps that people want to ride, you're going to attract riders better than you. They'll become friends with them. And then your world's going to kind of open up. So either building jumps or spending time at jumps and being in areas where people want to be, to ride not just like riding in your own little like private area is definitely going to help it's going to like kind of help create a community and always think of yourself as like someone who's riding with friends creating a community and just like always being in the scene like the biking scene and like so much of sponsorship is not only skill but having like a really good outlet to build up that skill and having like a really good place for practicing like i talked about here and just like having those connections build over time and being like in a community. Okay, one other question here. How do you keep up with frustrations? Um, I'm not quite sure like what frustrations you're talking about exactly, but I mean, when it comes to like learning itself, like some frustrations would be um, just like patience, like everyone learns at a different pace in a different way in terms of like some of the skills I've learned, I, I have been riding with friends who they'll learn something in a few days. It has honestly taken me weeks or months, but the difference is everyone learns differently. So you have to like look at how you learn and really like kind of look at, like really evaluate yourself and understand how you learn and then work around that. For example, with me, like I tend to learn things slower, but they stick with me for a long time. So say for example, it's like a, bigger trick like a tail whip. I think that trick took me six months to learn. I remember friends who learn it in like a week of trying, but I can go like a couple of years without doing one. First trying to jump, I can just do it perfectly because it's like imprinted in my brain now. It was a longer learning process, but it's never going away. So that's one thing, understanding how you learn. And same with like other life frustrations, like if you look at things like, um, like the financial aspects of like affording mountain bikes, bikes are really expensive trying to get to events or just trying to set aside time to build trails and ride and practice can be really tough to like find the time and to afford life. So you just have to really get effective at time management and you really have to like put your all into it, like really evaluate how you're spending your time and what's your number one priority. Because if you're spending more time with friends than you are practicing riding your bike, maybe the mountain biking isn't your priority. So you can't, get frustrated, you have to like really put yourself at fault for not setting aside that time for learning. And that's kind of one thing, that's one way I keep up with frustrations is, is like everything I'm frustrated about is always my fault. So if I, if it's my fault, then I'm in control of it. And I really can look at like how I'm, how I'm spending my time and reevaluate that. So that's one way I really keep up with frustrations. 
And same with injuries. Like every time I've been injured, it's always been my fault. And I just have to like focus on getting better so I can move to the next thing. And that kind of transitions nicely, that question into like how I'm talking about staying healthy. And I really talk about nutrition. So I, I'm i gonna scan through this really quick compared to the first one, because we went over this in the first one. But nutrition is really important. Check out this document after the workshop and read over. I just have a few basic like nutrition tips and things for your health that I do. And same with, with training. Time management, I talked about that already when I answered the question for you. So there's a few tips here that I do to really manage my time. Like I'll only look at something once. I'll make a list of things to do for the day. Um, I'll plan how long each thing will take. Like, so for example, I have to go work on a trail for three hours this morning. I want to go ride for two hours. And then I have some work to do at home for this many hours. And if I really like commit to a schedule like that, my day gets filled up really fast. I get a lot done and it's a really effective way to work. So that's huge. So those are some of the ways to practice and train on your bike. Okay, before I get into networking and the social media side of things, I'm gonna answer a few more of your questions here. Let's see, so from Abby, hey Mark, I'm wondering how to get sponsored or be an ambassador and your bubble up files helped me a bit, but I'm still having trouble. My situation is a bit different and harder because I'm 13 and I'm in Australia. I think it's a bit harder to get noticed in Australia and I don't like to race, um, but you like doing media, okay. And you find it very hard to get noticed. Well, especially like, yeah, definitely being in the Southern Hemisphere is a little more difficult than being in North America or Europe. Um, and I'm finding it very hard. How can I do this even if I'm not that good? I think like you almost have to look at, okay, like you wanna be a sponsored athlete. You wanna like say that's really your, you wanna pursue that as your career. And if you're 13, you you shouldn't be frustrated. It's, it's patience. Like when I was 13, I was working a paper route making like 20 bucks a week. I was riding a crappy little BMX bike and saving up for a mountain bike. I had no sponsors, like just a couple random people to ride with at the local skate park. I was building a single dirt jump down the road from my parents' house and I, I had like nothing. And so you have to really think about like when you're 13, you're so young, you have so much time ahead of you and you don't need to stress about sponsorships. Like that's the age to just like have fun with friends, spend time on your bike, really like, if you're like that focused on becoming a pro athlete at that age, that's that's awesome, but don't let it consume you. Like just have as much fun. Don't worry about getting noticed, but do things consciously that are gonna help you get noticed. So like you have to earn it, right? Like there's no like magic equation to finding someone who's gonna notice you or like help you learn the perfect way. You just have to like do all the right things that are gonna bring you to that path eventually. So like being 23, let's say you want to get for a pro by the time you're 18 that's that's a really young age to turn pro like i didn't technically do this full time until i was 25 so it did take me a bit longer um but if 18 is your goal at age 13 just like make a five-year plan for yourself and think about like all the things you need to do to become valuable valuable to a sponsor by the time you're 18. so keep working on your skills keep practicing and riding hard find people better than you to ride with i mean look at some of the platforms that are the easiest for you to grow on organically. So like, like Instagram is great because it's so big and like same with like Instagram and Facebook are great because they're like the two big ones. But I mean, TikTok and YouTube have way more organic reach and growth. So if I was you, like, and, um, like it's so easy for a 13 year old these days to have something like a GoPro, just get like a GoPro, um, film yourself, document yourself riding, especially if you're not like wanting to do contests. You're gonna really want to document everything and, and think about that. Like, think about that's like one of the number one things I was gonna talk about in this next section here as networking as an ambassador. Um, you need something to give people. And if you can document every single thing you're doing, that's great. Like every time you go on a ride, have that GoPro running, talk to the camera, put out a few go, put out a few YouTube videos a week, put out a couple of TikTok posts a day. Like it's a lot of work, but if you can like pump out that much content and just have while still having fun with your riding at age 13, like it will be crazy. By the time you're 18, like you could potentially have a huge audience and you have just been having fun this whole time. It might be hard to do that volume at that age, especially like when you get a bit older, you're gonna need a job that's gonna take up more of your time, that plus school. But if you can like do that as much as you can while riding and having fun, I mean, that's really what's gonna help you. Um, okay, I'm gonna 
there's quite a few questions here, but I'm going to jump into the networking piece. This is really going to help a lot of people. Okay, let's, let's jump into some of the points here. All right, how to network. Um, here's some of the main things you can do. Attend events, create relationships and real friendships, build rapport with people you regularly, regularly cross paths with. So what I mean by that is let's say you go to like your local enduro race or even bike shop, because we're talking about relationship building here, and you see a local rep for a bike company you like. So this person isn't high up with a bike company, but let's say they're like, let's say they're like a local rep that comes into a bike store or goes to a local event and they promote a brand and they get the products out there. Those people are so easy to access and they're your number one person to get you like higher up into a company. Like that person knows the person, for example, who's the marketing manager for that company who knows like the person who is in charge of like sponsoring the athletes. So it's such a small community, especially in the sport of mountain biking. Like everyone knows someone, everyone's connected in some way. It's a really cool, small, like intimate community. So if you can like start to meet people that way, that's going to be great. And that's going to really help you with sponsorships because it's really all about who you know, honestly, at the end of the day, not just about your riding itself. Um, give, don't ask when meeting people for the first time. So when you come up to a company, everyone makes the mistake of being like, hey, like, here's my resume. And they open up the resume and it, it just talks about you and like what, like what tricks you can do or like what you want from them. And you're not giving the company any value. So when you're just meeting people, always have a give mentality. Like never ask for anything. Just like think about things you can do. Like say you go up to like the Shimano rep, for example, at a tent at an event and you're like, hey, like I have all these like videos of me riding where I have like Shimano gear on my bike. Um, if you want these videos to like post on your Instagram account or whatever, like um, give me your email address and I'll send you all this footage. And then like, you're giving them content, even if you don't think you're the best rider, but you have some like things you think are kind of cool to share. Just like, or even you can even like direct message companies and you can offer to give them stuff like content of yourself riding, or you can share your videos with them. But like people love content. They're, they're always looking for stuff to post. That's one of the things that my sponsors are always asking me for. Like athletes, like you, you wouldn't believe, like even like the best riders in the world who have like the best support are a lot of them are not good at this and they're not good at getting content over to their sponsors. So if you can be like just some kid who has that ability to like send stuff over to companies, even if you're not sponsored by them, then they might think it's pretty cool. And, and like, just be really relentless, like do it for weeks, months, years, like keep sending them stuff. Eventually they'll cave and they'll want to support you because they're going to appreciate your hard work. And I mean, if your content is good and what you're doing is good, then you're, you'll be like, you'll be set um, and that comes into like creating or producing something unique that draws people to you on or off the bike so you have to really get creative in your own way this is for people who are not competing you really have to stand out in some way so for example with myself like I've kind of focused on like my GoPro videos because the way I film them really complements my riding style and they stand out from a lot of other people's point POV footage and I think that's really helped me like grow and help my style stand out. So that was something unique I was able to provide. And that's really helped my content. So think about what you have that's unique. Everybody has something. You just kind of have to tap into that strength and think about it. And one thing that really holds people back on like networking and social media in general is worrying about others judging them. So you might not post something because you don't think it's going to get that many likes, or you might not think your friends think it's a cool post. But you need to be true to yourself and you just need to post as much as you can and do whatever you want to do. Don't worry about other people. And like, because honestly, like no one really cares as much as you, and people will sense this confidence and they'll start looking up to you. So really networking is a big thing. Okay, be before I jump into um some of the ambassador points, I'm gonna get into some more questions here. Okay, should I have podiums in Enduro to have sponsors? All right, so like Obviously, the better results you have as a racer, the better. Like racing is very black and white that way. But you don't necessarily need to be a podium athlete to get sponsors. Like just the fact that you're like actively going to enduro races is huge. Like that's that's great. I think what you should be doing, like if I was someone who was like wanting to be a professional enduro racer, 
right? Don't have any sponsors and I'm not getting, getting podium results. I would be filming and documenting every single event I'm going to. I'd be doing a YouTube post, a TikTok post, an Instagram post for every single event I'm going to. Actually, I'd be doing multiple posts for every single event I'm going to, maybe one YouTube with like as my main piece of content with like multiple posts about it afterwards on other platforms. I would just go heavy on social media content and I would start building up like a really strong portfolio for myself. And then when I talk to sponsors for a while, then I'll have um, like a really strong set of content to show them and they'll see what I'm doing. And honestly, like if you're documenting that often, you're going to build an online community because people are going to be interested in following what you're up to and they, they want to see your journey. Okay, so here's some notes just to think about when you become a sponsored rider. Um, so you're now a spokesperson for that brand you represent. You always have to be mindful of this when you're in public. You're basically a public image for that logo you're wearing or that bike you're riding. And you need to think about like, you need to be a great person off the bike too, right? Like you need to be active in your riding community, go to local trail days, help out with building your trails, encourage kids at like the bike park or wherever you are, like to learn something. If you see kids on bikes, just be really nice to everybody. And if you have the ability to organize an event, like a group ride even, or like um, if it's a company you want to be sponsored in that's running like a demo day, go to one of those events and ride with everyone and be really active in your community. Um, give people your time, be approachable, spark up conversations with people. I mean, this was really hard for me when I was younger because I was like very shy, but I was always like really friendly and nice. And even if I wasn't talkative, even if that's not natural to you, just like, be nice and friendly to people, educate them on like what's on your bike if they ask you a question. And always focus on like those who are supporting you, whether it's your companies or like people that follow you or anyone who's in your community. Like, so for example, I'm doing stuff like this because it's awesome for like educating you and giving back to you guys. I'm doing this for not just me, I'm doing it for everybody. So that's like this workshop itself is an example of how you can be a great ambassador and bring value back to people. So those are the main key points on networking as an ambassador. There's some more social media tips here. First, I'm gonna get into some of your questions because I've like tossed a ton of information at you here. We're only half an hour into the workshop and I really wanna spend a lot of time on how to create a pitch deck that's gonna be really successful for you. We're probably gonna go over the hour, but I just really wanna get into this. So thank you for that last question, Raphael. I'm gonna go into Stefan's question now. Um, Stefan's saying, where I am, most of the jumps I do do not give me enough air for bigger tricks, nor do I have to land or create my own jumps um, that allow for good progression. What would your plan be around the setback? Um, so you're not doing jumps that give you enough air yet. Um, and you don't have land to create your own jumps for good progression. This is really tricky. Um, so depending on where you live, like I was super lucky because I grew up in a place where there is like a lot of forest just outside the city. And I probably built jumps like in over 10 different spots before I found a place that got torn down. And I don't know the, like, I don't know the laws where you live, but as a kid where I live, like we would just like kind of be <laughs> reckless kids and we'd build on illegal areas like private property or like It'd be like municipal property and like city workers would come in and tear down our jumps. And eventually one day some like older lady saw us riding bikes in a ditch, like on this little jump. And she's like, Hey, I have land if you guys want. And I, like, this was like after like years of stuff getting torn down for us and they let us build jumps on their property. And we had jumps for a couple of years and that was really what helped me. So I honestly got super lucky and it's, it's really hard to give you an answer for that. But there's more bike parks popping up, like as mountain biking is growing as a sport, it's becoming so much more legit. And I feel like it's way more common for jump parks to be around. So search your area, see what's out there. Um, even go on trailforks.com and see like what jump trails are around, see what existing trails are already there. And I find that's a really good way to like find a place to build that can help you with your own progression. Because like if something's on trail forks, it's, it's official and it's there already. And that's kind of where I've found some of my spots recently, not on trail forks, but we have a lot of unsanctioned trails that we know are safe because they've been there for years. And a lot of the trails I build out now are like right beside trails that already exist. And 
I'm not too worried about people riding my stuff. So I just kind of build nearby an existing area and it's safe because since that area is sanctioned or if it's unsanctioned, it's deemed as safe because it's been there for years. Then I know that I'm, I'm in a safe place to build. And I think that's kind of a really good strategy. So um, number one thing I would do, I would go on trailforks.com. I would see what trails are in your area, look at kind of what land they're on, um, find out if a local bike club is, is like, um, the local bike club is kind of coordinating that whole trail network. I would have hit them up and be like, yeah, I just want an area for some like jumps in this area. Like, is it okay if I build here? And you never know, like you might be good to go, but I think if you want to go like the safest way possible, that would be my strategy for having bigger jumps and to get that kind of community started. Okay, this one's from Kate. Do you have any mental training with a sports psychologist, like your own visualization, medication, et cetera? Also, how do you manage fear that comes after a severe injury? I also broke my leg on a bike and I hit a wall mountain biking with fear of re-breaking my leg. I know exactly what you're going through. And I, I've never actually worked with a sports psychologist, but I did go to university for sport and fitness leadership. And we did have a lot of psychology and like sports related stuff. It was funny. It was like a business program with um, a lot of like Olympic based stuff and blended in. So it was almost like a business degree with some sports related courses. Um, we did go into some psychology around sports and because we did have some crossover courses with, with um, sports massage therapists. And yeah, I learned a little bit about visualization and meditation through that. But a lot of it is like honestly self-taught and um, how I manage fear. It probably took me two years after breaking my femur at Red Bull Rampage before I felt comfortable going big again because like I just couldn't like make the risk worth the reward for myself. I couldn't justify it. And then as I got more comfortable and I got stronger again and I was, I was 100% physically ready to like hit everything again, it came back really quick because I really missed that feeling of going bigger on my bike. I really needed to go bigger. Like I, I'm, I'm addicted to that adrenaline and that push and that um, like breakthrough, like that feeling when you're terrified of something, but then you land it is like such a rewarding feeling. And it's so confidence building and inspiring that like, it's worth it more for me to have that feeling like it's worth breaking a leg again to keep that feeling going because it, like it builds so much confidence and stills like so much pride in me compared to like other things in life that like honestly like chasing after that feeling feeling is really what helps me in life and i know it's been like a really strong tool for helping me with all aspects of my life so i always put it into that perspective like i need to push it that's my perspective it's something that i need so I think when it comes to like overcoming fear and managing fear, you really have to look at like what you need as a person, like what, like think about it from that perspective, like what am I looking for? Um, what do I want to get out of life? Like, am I going to be really bummed out and have regrets if I don't push it and I am too scared to hit something? Like if I stay tame on my bike the rest of my life, am I going to be sad about that? Or am I completely happy riding at that level? So you have to really think about that. And if you want something bad enough, I truly feel like you can push through that fear. You just really have to stay focused on what you want and what you want to happen versus what you don't want to happen. So like if I'm trying something new and scary for the first time, I'm always thinking in my head, what could go right? I'm never thinking what could go wrong. As soon as you start to think about what could go wrong, that's where your brain goes, that's where your focus goes, and that's when crashes happen. And and at another level too, like crashes also happen from being overly confident, not thinking, just kind of zoning out and riding. And when you zone out and ride, you can forget about what how risky what you're doing is actually is. You can go down like like in the like the drop of a bucket, like you could just crash out of nowhere and it could be really bad. And I've had some really bad crashes like that where my focus is just actually I think all my bad crashes are from losing focus where fear was blocked out, but focus wasn't there. And I, I didn't, um, like, I just wasn't calculating it properly. So or a big part of that is consider all the risks, know they're there, but really focus on like the goal you're trying to achieve, visualize it happening. Don't think about anything else. Think about why you're doing it. And if that all aligns with like your goals and you can have it in that perspective, then your fear is really easy to manage. Okay, next question from Luke. When can you, um, what can you do when you keep falling off a larger jump? 
you are comfortable with all the rest. Um, how, okay, so you're falling off something bigger, but you're comfortable with everything else. So maybe like getting to that one step up is really hard for you. Um, I mean, it's really hard to, without seeing specifically what you're doing to answer that, but I would say a big part of it is try like, try to go back to those smaller jumps you're already comfortable on, but make them more challenging for yourself. Because if you're like having trouble on a bigger jump and you're falling, but a smaller jump, you're riding like comfortably, comfortably, then it might just be the mental game, man. Like you might have the skill because smaller jumps are not really any more difficult in terms of like the technicalities. They can actually be easy, harder because there's quicker movements involved. I think what it is, is it's your, it's your mental aspect of it. Like maybe riding off that taller, steeper ramp is scaring you and you're hesitating and you're not as relaxed as you would be on a, a smaller jump. So you just have to like stay more relaxed, try to get more comfortable and you really have to trust yourself. And I mean, if you've, if you've fallen off the jump before, you know what it feels like to go off it. I, I'd say just like keep trying as if you're not putting yourself at like physical risk, like if you're crashing safely, like if it's just like a mellow jump off the bike, kind of slide down the landing sort of situation, I would say keep doing it until you can get comfortable. But I can't think of any moment where I learned, like when I was learning, where I would consistently fall off a jump over and over without trying a trick. So if, if you're just like straight airing it and you're still falling, falling that much, I think it's out of your skill level or it's like way above your comfort zone and you need to just keep scaling down. You need to get even more comfortable on those smaller jumps. Maybe you learn some more tricks on those smaller jumps and make it get to the point where like you're super bored of the smaller ones and you're ready for the bigger one. That kind of answers the next question by uh, Sumit. <laughs> How do you get confident on bigger jumps? Uh, so yeah, it's the same thing. Go down, get super bored on the smaller jumps first. And uh, it's, it's all mental, man. Like it's not any more difficult. You just have to trust yourself and you really have to like trust that you can do it. Get scared for a while and keep doing it until it's not scary anymore. It's It's just a game of repetition and really like trusting yourself and really like putting it through in your mind, like breaking down what you're doing and planning it out. Okay, I'm gonna go into social media. I still have to like talk about some of those tips before we really get into creating roles and we're already at 35 minutes in. Okay, social media. Um, so let's jump into this. Engage with your audience, be social. So it's called social media because you're basically creating an online community I mean, it's not just about showing off what you do. It's it. Don't make social media about you. Make it about everyone who's seeing your content. So post what other people want to see without caring what other people think. So it's, it's kind of a weird thing. Like, um, I guess post like what you want to post and then just experiment with tons of stuff and see what sticks the best. And then if you like your, if like a community starts to build or people start to like something, then do more of that thing because you know it works. That's a great way. You also really want to engage with people, be social, leave comments, messages, create content that's going to start a conversation. So like have a call to action or ask a question in your in your like video content or in your captions or however your whatever your media format is. Like always be kind of trying to build up a community in a, in a sense. Um, you if you're a, a media athlete, so if you're not like necessarily competing, if you're pure media, this is like mandatory. You have to do this. You need to regularly post on on platforms. Um, in an ideal world, this is what I would say the structure is: Instagram at least once a day, TikTok at least three times a day, YouTube at least three four times a week, and Facebook once a day. So that's kind of the numbers I give for myself. It's a lot of work, but these four platforms you need to do. Um, TikTok and YouTube are probably the most important in 2020 in terms of like trying to grow your social media and get like a bigger audience because they have the most organic growth than anything else out there. Facebook owns Instagram. They're a huge like corporation. So is YouTube, it's owned by Google, but I find YouTube is much more searchable and your stuff is more likely to be found. So TikTok and YouTube, Definitely get on those. If your content is good, you can organically get like hundreds of people a day following you if you have good stuff and you're posting multiple times a day. 
Um, once you hit a certain level, you can afford to hire people to work with you. So that's way, way down the line. But if you look at guys like Matt Jones, Fabio Widmer, and even myself, like I'm starting to work with some filmmakers to help me with my content. I'm getting to that level where I can start to afford that. And it just makes the world of a difference. And create. So when you're not writing, you should be creating. Don't put a lot of pressure on yourself to make the perfect post, like I've said before. Don't worry about others judging you. Just capture what you love. Post as much as you can. Experiment with different things. Don't worry about likes or like comments or any of that. Just like put stuff out into the world, see how it does, and then kind of like evaluate what's working the best and continue with that. I have some examples here for you guys to check out after the workshop. So like my teammate at Marin Bikes, Matt Jones, he's been a big inspiration for me to like even get my YouTube channel started because like the stuff he's doing is really, really cool. And his community is like more engaged than any ones I've ever seen. And then Fabio Widmer, he's just like at a whole new level with millions of followers and like the most popular mountain biker on the internet today. Really cool stuff. And then there's so many different business accounts out there on the internet that have tons of really cool tips that really cross over to mountain biking. And um, here's a video you should watch by someone I follow called Gary Vaynerchuk, just a social media kind of guru and business person. He has really good tips and I would really recommend like consuming this kind of content when you can just for like tips on how to build up your social. Okay, so that's kind of all the main points on social media. I'm gonna teach you how to build, I'm not gonna say a resume because Everything I'm going to talk about in here is applicable to a resume. And if you look at acquire sponsorships tab, I do have my original athlete resume from last year, a little pitch deck I gave to people at Eurobike in 2000 or in 2019 for how to create value and a schedule that I made for people. So like how to create a schedule. Um, I'll show you what a schedule is. It's simple. Just like, well, because of coronavirus, none of this stuff happened, but these are, this is like the rough like schedule for my year, that's something you should always give sponsorships. Tell them what you're doing for the year, even if it's a year in advance and you're not quite sure, just let them know like kind of what you're thinking of doing. So these are all documents you can check out after the workshop, but I'm really gonna dive into how to create an athlete resume and all the things that are involved. So I'm gonna get out of this folder and I'm gonna go into the folder that I did on how to, um, on this proposal I did for Kuat Racks. So I did this two months ago, maybe not even quite, and I took, I extracted information off of my other athlete resumes. I made it applicable to that brand. So they're a rack company. And what was really cool about this is I was able to put in all the content I would in a resume that I usually make two pages, but I probably had like five pages. Like if I put this in a PDF, it would be five pages long. It would be really long and really hard to, to consume, but I turned it into a role. So I'll give you an example. I'll just give you a quick like kind of look through of this and then you'll see what the final thing looks like. And then I'm going to go into some details. So that like that's my introduction page because you always do an introduction in your resume. This is what I offer. So all the things I offer. So that would be like two pages of writing in a Word document. And then support that I require, all the categories. Okay. And then you can actually drag photos into these categories. And then you can go to the plus symbol here and you can create a role and it generates a role that you can customize, which is really cool. So I'm gonna teach you how to do that, but first of all, I'm gonna show you what the final thing looked like. It became one simple, clean page. I'll scroll through the whole thing really quick so you can see it. And I did a custom link as well and a custom logo for the company. So they were really impressed. And then they were stoked. And look how much cleaner and simpler that is than like a multi-page resume. And I also have like direct links to my social media at the bottom. Everything's really clean. I can like put little notes on it. So this whole like creating roles thing is really, really cool. It's helped me create like really good resumes and I'll teach you how I'm doing this. Um, I'll basically show you what I did to make this and then I'll show you how to customize it. But first of all, I'm going to answer a few more questions because we have a lot of questions here and I don't mind going over a bit of time. I still have 18 minutes left on the actual time of the workshop. And this, this is going to take a while, but I want to answer some of your questions here. So this one's from Jesus. Hey, I've been reading a little, oh, riding a little over a year and I ride mostly fixed gear. I have a reputation, um, but I can't get any brands to look at me to get sponsors. Uh, so, 
whether or not if you're competing really focus on that but i i think like you still need to make content and if you have a bit of a reputation you just need to like that's great that means you're probably a really good rider and like people love to spend time with you but you you need something for a sponsor to want you on top of that like so you it seems like you're already on the right track but you need some extra value to provide so you either need like podium results at events or you need some like really good documentation and really good content to share and you have to show that you work really hard off the bike not just on the bike i think that's going to be like the number one thing that's going to help you okay from jonas um how much time do you spend on social media isn't it hard to manage time and not stay with instagram um um, I think sometimes it holds me back to just to go riding. What's your strategy? This is a lot of work. Um, so to give you an idea of my typical day, like in order to make this work, like you have to be super good at managing your time, working a job or going to school and doing this. It's my full-time job now and it's very manageable. But my typical day looks like this. Like I wake up around 7 a.m. Unless I'm creating a video where I want to hit a trail with early morning light, then I'll wake up at like 5.36 and be home for like 8.39. But typically I'll work up, wake up at 7 a.m., um, make breakfast, do emails for a couple hours. I'll get out for a ride by like 10 o'clock or go build. Um, so in the winter, I got, I got a lot more, like the days are shorter, but I have a lot more time to do this. So like in the winter, I'll kind of do that. Then I'll like go trail build usually or go ride until like it's dark around five o'clock. I'll come home, like have dinner, and then I'll spend probably four or five hours every night working on social media or like researching some things or like learning new things like I'm like I'm addicted to learning and that's the the big thing like um I definitely work like 12 plus hour days every single day because I'm I'm loving what I'm doing so like I don't have time for Netflix often or other things like or chilling with friends so much lately especially with coronavirus going on I'm really focused on work um but it's yeah it's it's a lot of work you just have to like really decide where your time is going like you're gonna have to sacrifice like like if you want to really nail down social media then you don't have time to like just watch random videos or hang out with friends multiple times a week like you're gonna have to make biking your life social media or not like competing same thing like the top riders like guys like brandon Sumnak, they don't hang out with friends after riding like they go and they keep riding and then they work on other stuff at night like they're go 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 so you definitely have to sacrifice like the social aspect and like you definitely have less downtime you're you're busy all the time and you have to be happy with that schedule and you have to like that so my strategy is just, i love to go and i just i always go i find waking up really early because i'm lucky i'm a bit more of a morning person so i can wake up at like 5 36 in the morning and even if i didn't get to bed until almost midnight i can run on less sleep i wouldn't recommend that but i can sometimes i definitely get eight hours when i can but i can run on a bit less sleep once i once i'm awake and i'm going like even if i get up at like 6 a.m and go for a quick run around my neighborhood and then come home after like a five minute run like i'm suddenly energized and ready for the day so i'm really lucky that way and i find there's less distractions early in the morning i get a lot more done and I can even do like emails and some social media creation before like 9 a.m. Then I still have the whole day ahead of me. Um, okay, so that's my strategy. One from Luke. I'm really wanting to become a pro um, XCO rider and I'm 15 years old. Um, is it good to start to, to start training now? Yeah, definitely like at age 15, you're young, but definitely like train, but don't let it consume you. Like keep riding as fun as possible. Um, do as much as you can and yeah just like just start training but don't like don't train like a pro like like team sports athlete would train you know like like keep it fun get some sort of like some get some sort of like routine going daily that's going to improve your riding without like burning yourself out especially at a young age like that you want to keep it like you're only 15 years old so you just want to make sure every day on your bike is having fun because as soon as you stop having fun at a young age, like it's just game over. I know a lot of riders who are like pushed at a young age. And by the time they were like in their early twenties, they were just kind of over it because they took it way too seriously. So you definitely got to like keep things fun and keep it lifelong. All right. There's a handful more questions, but I'm really going to dive into um, how to do some rolls. Just need some water here. All right. So I'm going to, um, 
put questions off to the side for now so I can see my whole screen better. But this is what a folder looks like, as you guys have seen. And this is how you make an athlete resume. Um, in order to make these four folders I did, you go to the plus symbol, really simple, and then you click folder. You can label folder and then click create. And when you do that, it's gonna create one of these. These are the three main things that I always put when I'm trying to get a sponsor into a document. My introduction, where I'll say something about myself, what I offer, so what am I giving this company? What are all the services I offer? What value am I providing you as a company? And then finally, the support that I require. These are three things you need. So if you're creating a proposal right now for a company, make those your three categories, create three folders, do that. Um, if you wanna do this, like follow along and do this on Bubble Up as I'm doing it, you can go for that too. I'm gonna do it a little kind of high paced because we don't have a ton of time here and I wanna get to everyone's questions before I go. But yeah, that's one of the things, those are the three subjects you can do. So you can create an introduction, what you offer for companies, support you require. Okay, so introduction. I just talk about myself. I put a relevant photo with it. This isn't the best photo, but this wasn't like a huge resume I was presenting to a bunch of people. This was like a specific thing for a smaller company. I thought that was a cool shot because it really kind of, it had a picture of me with something I built and it kind of showed that I work hard. And it was like most authentic to me. Like there's like so many like pro level photos because I work with a handful of professional photographers. I could have had like the sickest shot ever of me behind a big mountain range or like doing a backflip on a jump or something as this first shot. But I chose something that like showed me as a pe person had a bit more humanity to it. And it like just, I, I just wanted like the most authentic shot. So I used a shot of like something that took me all winter to build with me like standing up, just tossing the horns. So I used that as my introduction photo. I talk about how I've been riding bikes since 2001. Um, I have 15 years of experience being sponsored. It's a lifelong passion for me. So I talk about my passion, what my focus has been as an athlete. And today, what do I do to contribute to push my riding and my bike community? Um, so I'm contributing to the community, I'm building unique features, and I'm organizing high quality media projects. Those are the three things that really will catch people's attention because those are the three things that I'm doing that is bringing value to my sponsors and that they have seen great return on. And I can proudly like present that to someone else and feel confident in my ability of that. So that's my introduction. So you always make that. So it's really easy. So how I did this is actually really cool. I went to the plus symbol here. I just went note, created a note. I wrote out a title. So I would go like introduction. I wrote out all the words here and then I uploaded a dragged an image, took an image off my computer and that was kind of it. So really simple, saved it. And then it created this. I'll discard this because I don't need to, I'm not going to create a new one from scratch, but that is what was made. That was my introduction, super easy. Okay, and then what I offer. So this is like the first thing you gotta do that like really hits people in the face and makes them say, whoa, this person is awesome. They have all the stuff I wanna see in an athlete. What I offer. It shows the back, the first image was projects and Bubble Up kind of, the first thing they do is um, they put in like a background photo for whatever your first photo was. So like the projects item, I really liked this photo from Turkey and I liked how it made my folder look. The thing is though, when you make a roll, no one's gonna see this. It's just, I did it for myself, but what I offer. So obviously my social media is probably my most valuable asset today, aside from like the actual content I'm creating and other forms like articles for Pink Bike and YouTube videos for sponsors, not my own channel. So I have the ability to create high quality media projects and I've produced a lot of like high quality advertisements for brands, but my social media is my largest reach. So I created a separate folder for that just because of the way roles are created, it kind of set it off to its own thing on the side, which I thought was really cool because then when my role was created, I had like all those links at the bottom of the role and people could easily click on them. So you can also drag things around once a role is made. So I created a link to all my social media accounts, put in my following numbers. I actually have to update these because they've grown a bit since. And I um, linked it. So for example, this is all I did. I went link. I would like paste in the Instagram link. So let me just go to my own Instagram page here to give you an example of how this would work. It's really simple. There's my Instagram account. 
copy that. And then I would go the plus symbol again. This is the easy, you can do this on your phone, but I, I prefer to do it on desktop just because I like, whenever I feel like I'm creating something professional, I like to be behind a computer. I clicked on the link button, pasted a link in there, and it popped up automatically. It comes with that old photo of myself, but then you can go to the three dots at the top here. You can click edit, change the photo, you can change the description, you can change the title. So I would just go like Instagram, and then I would go like 356, Okay, followers, and then save it. And then it would look just like the other ones. That's all I did, super simple. And the coolest part is when you create a role, that's gonna pop up with your photo on the role. And then if someone clicks on the shot, it links directly to your social media. This is like such an amazing solution because I hate sending people documents and I hate receiving documents where there's a million links attached to them. This is like a really clean way to implement it and it allows the person to click on what they want to see. Okay, but more importantly, let's look at all the things you need to know when you're pitching to a sponsor, what you can offer them. I talk about the projects I do, how I engage in my community, the content I deliver, product feedback and representation, and events I go to. So let's read through my resume content so you can see what I did. So it's the same thing, you create a note, you drag in one photo to go with your note, not every note needed a photo that would have made the role really long, but I put a couple photos in what I offer just to like break it up nicely and give the role some visuals. Okay, projects. I talk about my trail building, especially right now, it's such a big project for me. Like as soon as this workshop is over, I'm actually going up to my trail to do some building for a few hours. Okay, so building new lines for trails um, and video parts to contribute to the local riding community is a never ending cycle for me. I'm passionate about creating. So I'm not only doing this for myself, like there's not that many advanced jump trails out there and it's what I love to build. And every time I build something new, like people in my community find it, they ride it. And like, I'm totally cool with people riding what I've built. I'm not one of those riders who's like, this is my film line, you can't film this because I built it. I was when I was younger because I was like a little more defensive. I didn't have support yet. And I had to be a little more careful. I had to almost build something for me and not other people. And I had to like save it for a video part. So it was kind of like a surprise. That's cool. Like if you want to do that, just like keep it low key and keep it secret, but never be one of those people who's like giving someone a hard time for writing your stuff. Like it's just like a negative way to be. You always want to spread positivity. And I'm trying to like really emulate that in my message here that like I'm working hard, but I'm also spreading positivity um, and I'm traveling. So I've done like some amazing trips over the last like, few years and like with COVID going on right now, it's making me feel like even more grateful for this because like not being able to travel now is a little hard, but I've, I'm reflecting back on all my trips I've been on and they're amazing. So I talk about how my creative process like doesn't just, isn't just traveling, it expands to travel and adventure. So I'm talking about all the cool media projects I've produced. So if you haven't been at this scale, like if you're a younger rider, or if you're just getting into it, you haven't done all these epic trips, but you've done like, you can just talk about like, some things that you want to produce or some ideas you have. So I've talked about here, like I've been to Indonesia, Iceland, Turkey, Israel, Australia, New Zealand, Tibet. These are all places I've been like fortunate enough to go to because every single trip involved me partnering with a sponsor, a tourism board, a tour operator, or all of them. I've been like very resourceful to limit a sponsor's costs. And I've actually done some of these trips at zero cost to a sponsor. So I wanted like a quick, simple way to communicate that without making a long, elaborate document. I could have dove into more detail, but I'm just presenting like a one page role that I want people to like look at and they kind of get a sense of who I am and keeping stuff short as possible and effective, not too wordy. You see, like that's a short paragraph. That's like two sentences. Keep it simple, add a photo, make it nice to look at. Okay, what else do I offer? Content delivery. So this is what I answered someone's question earlier in the workshop. Um, always give people stuff even if they're not a sponsor of yours, but you're right. Like say you're riding a bike by Marin Bikes, send Marin over content to yourself. I personally know the guys at Marin Bikes and I know for a fact that if you're a younger rider who has like a San Quentin hardtail or something, it's a cheaper bike, but it's a fun bike to hit on like more beginner jumps and you're po you like are really stoked on it. If you like sent them a direct message and you're like, hey, I got, con I got some video clips of myself riding this bike I wanna give you. They're gonna love it. Like they're gonna be stoked, they'll share it and they're gonna remember you. And when you're looking for a sponsorship, 
you have to let them know that you're able to do this. So I just write, for many of my sponsors, I deliver a specific set of deliverables on a monthly basis. This is really common. For example, with Excess Energy, I give them five photos a month and a handful of video clips. And I get permission from the photographers to give them these photos for social media. Um, or if it's like, if I can't work with a photographer that month, like, or I can't afford to pay a photographer because some photographers require money, then what I do is I do a lot of my own self-shot stuff, which is one of the reasons I got this camera right here, the GoPro Max, because you can do really cool, unique stuff on it. Like if you go look at my last Instagram post, it's a shot of my backpack. It's a shot I got for Hydroplask with just this camera. So I didn't need a photographer. You can do lots of really cool stuff. So talk about how you deliver content. And finally, product feedback and representation. So this is, honestly, I believe, one of the number one reasons that racers get more support than free riders or media athletes, it's not just because of results. Obviously, someone like Aaron Gwynn is gonna sell a lot of bikes because people believe the fastest rider is on the best bike. And this is why sponsorships work in the first place. But another reason why racers get so much support is because they can offer the ultimate product feedback. If you're in a downhill or enduro race and your bike just blows up, that's the ultimate product test. Like there's no better way to test out something than pushing it at like a race at the highest level. But if you can give this value to a sponsor in some way or another, like that's gonna be really valuable to them. Like I know some riders who get some support, like just free bikes because they are really hard on bikes and they know how to test the bike out. And the bike company is like happy to give them a bike just to test it and see how it holds up. So that's something you need to really communicate to a company when you're pitching with them. And if you can like make this nice and short like this, it's gonna help. So here's what I wrote. I'm here to be put to work and help you test out new products. I make it my priority to have a strong knowledge of the products I'm writing. Being able to explain to people how they work, perform, and why they are good is very important. Okay, so really test out and help out. And then let them know that you're using your products, you're being exclusive, you're being loyal to the company. Almost every contract you sign when you get to the level of, of like signing contracts and like getting on payroll with brands, will have a clause in the contract that says basically what I'm saying here. And that just shows that you're professional and you know what you're talking about. So I use all provided products on an exclusive basis during any related activities, events, photo shoots, media events, and official events, any kind of any kind. In addition, I make it my best effort to prominently display the company's name, logos, all alike, and all alikes in a partnership. Um, I let them know they have unrestricted rights to use my name and likeness in connection with anything they're doing. And I just like put that statement in there just so they have it. Now I'm thinking about it, like all this stuff is like really good for you guys to know for your own resume. So I'm going to, um, I'll put this um, role into my um, become a sponsored athlete folder. So you guys can um, refer back to, you can like, like use this as a reference when you're creating your own stuff. Okay, events. I talk about events, it's not my main thing. Um, Earlier on in my career, when I was doing more events, like hitting more slope styles, I went to Rampage one year, all that sort of stuff. When I was hitting more events, I definitely made that more of a focus in my resume. So if you're an athlete who's competing, definitely maybe shift more of your projects item, more of your project section into events. But for me, I'm not an event rider. I do go to some that I've been going to for years and I wanted to state that in here. So Crankworx Whip Off, I always get invited to that. Um, they are downhill regional, enduro, and downhill races, and random opportunities. So I keep it kind of open-ended there. Keep it simple. That's all the things I offer. All that stuff there is going to be enough to like really impress a sponsor, especially if they link back to my social accounts and they see what I'm actually producing and the results that they're providing. They're like, wow, that got 20,000 likes. That's crazy. They see a return on their investment right away. And finally, support I require. A big part about being a professional is knowing your worth and owning it. Um, don't be afraid to ask for what you think you're worth, whether it's like product, money, whatever, and really communicate. And also like let them know how com important communication and commitment is because this is something I've learned over the years. When I was first getting sponsors, like when I wasn't making any money, but say someone would give me a free set of handlebars or like a wheel set or something like that, like I was so grateful just to get that product that I definitely undervalued myself and I let myself get walked on a little bit because I was scared of losing that support because I was just like so surprised that someone even gave me something for free. 
And this was kind of before social media was really a thing, like 2009, 10. So I was a good rider. I was going to events, but like it was really hard for me to stand out compared to like the guys who were winning stuff. So I, I didn't feel like I was really worth that much, even though I knew it. And I wasn't able to like really communicate that. So you really have to put this in your original pitch deck that you give a company. You have to know your worth. You have to really evaluate what you think you are worth from an outsider's perspective and communicate that into your thing. Okay, so I talk about my communication, my commitment, and the payment I need, but not from my end, from a company's end. So let's look at this. Communication. I send out regular updates to my sponsors on a bi-monthly basis, and I'm constantly checking in. Like I'm emailing, emailing people all the time. I'm, I'm about to send an email to someone right after this because they're like two months late getting some product to me, and like, like they're a great company and I love them, but like they need to know that's not acceptable. Like I need product when I need it. I can't be waiting two months for something because it's taking you an extra two months to get it out to your athletes. Like if you want me to run this, you have to communicate with me better and you have to keep this open. So always keeping it positive, but having your own strict set of rules. So I expect regular open communication to make both of us, to make sure both of us are doing the best job, job possible to help us meet our full potential. So you really have to let them know that you're you're here to provide a service, you're here to help them sell products, and you expect the same in return. Like most riders are just asking, 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 and hoping, and and you have to like almost put yourself on a pedestal a level where they desire you, and you have to show like what your expectations are. Commitment. So for all my serious long-term partnerships, I need commitment from the brand. I require a one to two-year contract and ongoing feedback for how I can improve to help you reach your goals. So for example, if a company is not going to give me a contract at all, or maybe like a three month agreement for like some chain rings or something, I'm not going to do that. Like I need at least a year or two because like, A, I'm at the level where I don't do anything for free. And B, if I'm getting paid, I need like a steady income because uh, I, I can't go months without money. So I need a one or two year contract where there's a payment schedule. And then I talk about payment. So uh, I'm at the level where I can get paid. Um, I say my preference is an annual salary with payment happening on a monthly basis. Half of my sponsors still pay me twice a year, like big amounts of money twice a year. And it's really hard to budget because you get like a check and then it has to like stretch through six months. And this was such a struggle the first couple of years I was getting paid because I wasn't getting paid very much money, it, but it was just enough with a combination of people. But every single person was giving me like just enough to get by that month, but I was only getting paid twice a year. So if I like, spend too much money one month because all of a sudden I felt like I had a lot of money then I was in a bad situation where I was like broke for a bit and this is something I've always kept in my agreements is that I need a monthly payment and it needs to be like for a year or two and then I took out the numbers here because those are like it just depends on you can't really put a number on something and you have to really that's a personal thing so you have to know what you're worth but depending on your expectations and deliverables my monthly rate ranges from this to that. That gives them options too. Like, so say it's only a hundred dollars a month you require. They're obviously going to be expecting way less out of you than a thousand dollars a month. So you can give them a range because when they come back with a number that kind of gives you a bit of leverage. You can say, okay, if I'm only getting a hundred dollars a month, then this is all you get. If you want more, it's going to cost 500 a month or a thousand a month or something like that. So it gives you that option. Those are all the things I do. And then what you do after that is you go to the plus symbol. Once you've put everything into your proposal, you click on roll, the roll button, then it creates a roll. So I'll say number two, because I did it already. Um, this is my roll, um, sponsor proposal. This is just like a really quick example. Nothing's <laughs> structured right, create, open role immediately it's going to want to do like the showcase theme which is my favorite theme so if you go up on to um the three lines here because i'm on edit mode oh wait i'm not on edit mode so there's edit mode and there's viewing mode so this is how it would look to a sponsor so let's take a look at how this would look to a sponsor what i just did in like the simplest form possible with bubble up folders um, i turn into a role and look, it turned into one page. I got my introduction here with some writing, scroll down, what I offer, scroll down, 
content delivery, product feedback, all the things we talked to are here on one page, what I offer. So that gets pushed down to here because I liked having that at the bottom. I'll show you how to shuffle things around in a minute. Um, and then you have like your social page, which is cool. Like I can say, okay, TikTok, like click on that. It's gonna take them right to the website where they can see my account here. And they can see, oh yeah, that is his, that is his account. And they, I don't have to like direct them off the proposal. They can just go back. Um, that's really cool. I like this feature a lot. And then I have all my stuff in here. And then support required at the end, payment, and that's it. A couple cool little things you can do. So I have a premium account, so I get a little more flexibility here. Um, I can go into edit mode. I can go and change my themes. So change theme. This completely changes how your resume looks. I'm not going to show you some of the other ones with this content because I know it doesn't really, I don't think the other themes really work that well for this format. Um, I'll show you an example here. A lot of them are like for photo galleries and stuff. and they're all for kind of specific uses. I've, like with the range that Bubble Up offers so far, these are all for specific uses. So if you look at this role, like it's kind of messy for this purpose. It doesn't really translate as well. And I experimented with a lot of different plat or a lot of different themes when I first started using roles. And I found that the showcase role is my absolute favorite theme for this purpose. But you can look at different ones. Like if you're going for a certain look, like if you have a ski resume, like this one obviously has kind of those accents to it, so it would it would work. The layout's pretty clean. It looks quite nice still. It does take out some of the writing from what you're saying, or it just kind of, I mean, this one's pretty good if it was for the right um, theme, but like for the right industry. I don't think it works honestly very good for this purpose, which is why I went with the showcase theme here, which I think is really great and it works well. And I'm sure, as Bubble Up continues to progress, more stuff's gonna roll out over the months, years, whatever. But this is a really great one for now, and I really love this one. You can edit stuff directly in your role too. So if you're in edit mode like I am, you can change your writing. Now this won't change your original notes, but it will change your writing, which is kind of nice. Like if you don't wanna change your original notes and you can have multiple versions of this to send to different companies. And because I have a premium account, I can play with everything else, like I can change the logos, I can put in my own custom logo, and I can even put in my own custom like URL. So I can make it like a link of a, and you can do that from your account. I feel like we could do like a whole nother lesson on just how to create this in more depth, but there's so many little options out there. And this is how the final thing looks. I think it's really great. I think it's awesome. Um, yeah, so there we go. I'm gonna jump back onto here and get my questions back up because I don't have my questions up right now and I need to, I've been talking for a long time. So before I even dive into more detail and all this stuff, I'm going to um, answer some questions for you guys, some questions for you guys here. Okay, so from Jacob, I've been posting lots of content here on Washington State. I feel the same problem. It's hard to get noticed with so many good riders around. What can I do to stand out from everyone else? I mean, when you say you've been posting lots of content, I would say like, is it multiple times a day? Because if you're posting that often, you shouldn't have any problem getting noticed if you're patient. And if you're posting like, if you post five things over a week and you do it for a few weeks and you're still not getting noticed, I don't know what exactly your situation is, but patience. Like if you've been posting lots of content for three years and you're still not getting noticed, then you're not doing the right thing. But you have to be patient. Um, and there's so many good writers. There's so many good writers out there, but there's so many people who aren't good at content. So just be patient and just keep being persistent with it and keep put, pumping stuff out there. Like just don't stop. And then like, even if after a year or two, you don't see the results you were hoping for, like just keep it going. Okay, how often should I post? Um, you're trying to grow Instagram twice a day, TikTok three times a day, and a YouTube post once a day. That is if you are, trying to do the best job possible. If you, that, and then any, as much as as much as you can, don't go over that number though, but I'd say as much as you can. Um, do you think age 15 is a good age to have a sponsorship? I don't think, I think that's too young unless you are um, like already competing at a high enough level to, to win stuff or you're riding at a high enough level to put out video content that's really gonna blow people's minds. Otherwise, like 
just focus on your riding, continuing to improve, having fun on your bike and documenting every single ride you go on. And the sponsors will eventually come after a few years. Um, do you know, I know you might have gotten this question a hundred times, but do you think it's possible to get sponsored during this pandemic? I was trying to line up a local sponsor this summer. I mean, I think so. So I, I've been very active with my sponsors through all this. I've been talking to them and we've been quite active and we've been like doing things like with Marin, we did the coloring contest giveaway where, where Matt Jones and I went on a Zoom call together and voted for our favorites. Marin's actively been selling lots of bikes still, surprisingly, just more online sales, I guess, and less retailer sales. But it's still a good time to find a sponsor. But I mean, it just depends on where you're at in your career. And um, the summer is also really hard. I would say this is not the best time of year to find a sponsor any, any like in the most ideal world because the way it's like company budgets work is they have, like they talk to athletes this time of year. They talk to athletes all summer. And then September, October comes, and that's when they decide who they're going to sign for January. And if it's like May, they're not going to sponsor you in June. They're going to, if it's May, you're going to start a conversation to try getting sponsored in January the next year. So I would say it's already too late in the year for you to get the sponsor for 2020. But you can start relationship building and you can start thinking about 2021. Mark, do you ever find sponsorship deals? through word of mouth from a fellow sponsored rider too? Does everyone work together like that? Yeah, definitely. I, yeah, that's a really good question, Amy. I feel like a lot of riders help each other out that way. Like, it's kind of weird because it's a small industry and people are competitive. Like my friends and I, no one really is open to telling each other how much they get paid. It's still kind of a mystery. There's a few of my friends who I have a rough idea of how much they're getting paid from different companies. Like I know a lot of the top riders get like, $50,000 a year plus contracts with just frame sponsors. I personally don't get nearly that much from, from a frame sponsor, but it's, I know it's up there for some of the bigger names. And I know that some of those riders help each other sponsorship deals too, and getting into events. Like for example, Rebel Rampage, I got into that event because I had guys like Dan Burkhoff and Jeff Golovich who had been competing at a few of those events, put their word of mouth in for me and helped me out. So. They help out with sponsors. They also help out with getting you into invite only events and definitely becoming friends with other pro athletes is going to be huge because not only are they going to like introduce you to sponsors like through an email or something, but say you're out at like an event or in the bike park doing laps together and you get to meet your friend who's a pro athlete, you get to meet their team manager in person. They introduce you to them. All of a sudden you have a connection. You might not be looking for a sponsor right away, but you can start building friendships. And um, we kind of did this with our, our uh, a friend a few years ago. We were going to Interbike in Las Vegas, where it was it's like a big trade show for sponsorships. And like my friend and I, we were both looking at like the list of contacts to hit up. And we like we helped each other out by like introducing each other to companies, which it does really help. It's really helpful. Okay, one other question here: um, What type of content ensues engagement without? revealing secrets, skills, if you're a competitive rider. Um, I honestly think like all this stuff I'm telling you right now is revealing secrets. Like honestly, I know most pro riders aren't gonna be comfortable telling you what they put in their proposal. They're so competitive, they're worried about someone taking their spot, but I think there's a lot of room for everybody and I don't think you need to worry about revealing secrets. I think the more you can give away for free, the more information you can give people, on top of being a really good rider and creating really good content, the more valuable you'll become because like people will want to know your secrets. And if you share them, you'll get followers from it. It's, it's that simple. Like basically the more helpful and useful you can be and the more quality, like there's basically, there's like three main points to this entire workshop. Number one, the more helpful and useful you can be to other people, the more valuable you'll be as an athlete, the better you're competing, like the better your skill level is, Obviously, the more valuable you are, because like as a good rider, you'll stand out. And the better you are at creating content and high quality media and working with photographers, filmmakers, and learning yourself how to use tools like this, like the more valuable you're going to become. So just all the things you can do to build up your skills and share those skills with the world is going to really help you. And I think as a competitive rider, if you were giving away secrets, like and say you were one of the fastest enduro riders in the world and you're like posting about some of your secrets. I mean, that person is still not you. They're, they're still not going to have your brain. 
they're still not going to be able to take your skills and beat you. Like, I think you can selectively share how much of those secrets you're giving away too. And that's really going to like, like even if you give away a snippet of what you know, that's really going to help people. And it's going to like really be valuable for yourself and your own personal brand. How can I get sponsors in a tension cross country? So it's, I think just trying to go for results. And like I said before earlier, like really networking with people at events that you know are industry people and all these things we've talked about already are really going to help you through this. So I'm going to, I'm going to skip some of these questions that I think I've kind of answered already because there's a lot of repeated ones here, but this one's really cool. Um, how do you plan content before a shoot? What's the process to capture what's needs? All right. That's a really cool question because I love how, um, I, I do plan a lot of stuff and I used to actually kind of stressed out about this. I'd be like, okay, like, I need to get a shot that looks like this for Instagram and I have it in my mind. And if I didn't get that look, I just wouldn't post something. And that really held me back. I think now the way I plan a shoot is honestly by a little less planning, but almost making a checklist. So like I'd have like a checklist app on my phone. I'll be like, okay, I'm going out because I need to do a shoot with my friend Scott from Marin, Marin Bikes. And we have like this many things to do. So I want to like do a tabletop on that jump. I want to backflip this jump. And I'll put like an, the order I want to do things in and what I need and like what kind of shot I have in mind to go up that trick. And then think about how long it's going to take me. And then I, we go out and we start creating. When it's a one person job, like say it's just me with my GoPro and I, I have a con content map in mind, like for that shot I did for Hydro Flask, I'm like, okay, I need a shot of the backpack. What are some cool ideas? And I just brainstormed a few cool ideas. And like the first thing came to mind was my 360 camera because I can show the product really well and get an exciting riding angle and I can do it by myself. So just thinking about a few ideas before you go out there. And honestly, like experimenting is the number one way to, to really start planning in the future. Like just go out there and like, it's almost like a shot in the dark. Just try a bunch of different stuff. Um, see what works the best in a shoot and what fails the most in a shoot and then kind of adjust accordingly. And that's kind of how I've planned out content for the future. Now I know like, okay, if we only have a two day window, I'm not going to do any cable camera shots because if I'm shooting with somebody who has a cable cam setup, that can be like a four to five hour setup for one shot. And if we don't have a whole week to create like a three minute video, then those kind of shots are going to be too time consuming and we need to like do stuff with drones that are going to look similar, but not maybe quite as good. And I, I kind of think about those factors just based on my experience. So a lot of it, you're going to learn by working with other people and seeing what takes a lot, a lot of your time and what you don't want to end up doing. What camera or platforms should I use for video editing? Okay. So 90% of my content today is shot with um, a GoPro. Like I just use like my hero seven black with um, the gimbal. And then I use my GoPro max, which I've been having a lot of fun with lately. So I got this one too. And then for cameras, I use a little Sony RX 100. It's, it's like a point and shoot with, with some SLR capabilities, like a $1,200 camera, really nice. So you can fit in your riding pack. You can fit in your pocket. Even it's really good. And it's really good for like action shots in the forest because it has a really nice low aperture. So that's the Sony RX 100. That's the camera that I love to use for myself or if I'm just out riding with like my girlfriend or something and I need her to take a shot of me because I'm not with a pro photographer, that's like a perfect camera. And then with the pro photographers, they all have like really high-end equipment and I get a lot of their photos and edit them myself. Then I use um, Adobe Lightroom for photos to edit and then Adobe Premiere Pro. And another thing too I have is I do have a folder full of GoPro tips, editing presets for Adobe Premiere where you can color grade your footage just like mine. So after this workshop, in addition with the, um, with the uh, resume um, folder, I'm going to add a link into the sponsored athlete folder that you can join to see some more GoPro tips and how to edit videos and how to color grade your videos like mine. That'll show you the program I use a bit more. So the program I use is Adobe Premiere. Um, how much time do I spend on social media? Isn't it hard to manage time? Um, yeah. Okay. So I answered that one already. So I'm actually going in the wrong direction right now. Oh, my computer's about to die. One second. All right. We're back. Good to go. Okay. Um, 
What's the best GoPro to film short movies or edits? Do you use a GoPro? Yes, I would say if you could only have one camera, go with the new GoPro Hero 8 because it has really nice stabilization. Um, the video quality is amazing. And you can do short edits on the GoPro Studio app for free or iMovie if you're on a Mac for free. And if you want to spend like a monthly rate on something really, really good, then get Adobe Premiere Pro. So just one simple GoPro Hero 8 and an editing program like the Studio or Premiere Pro. Okay, my opinion on the Hero 4. I think it's like if like you have the Hero 4, it's all you can afford because they're, they're older now. The lens is the, almost the exact same lens as the newest GoPro. It just doesn't have the stabilization and it doesn't have the wide range of settings. So this is a great camera if it's all you can afford. And then if you can find like a cheaper gimbal, like a wearable gimbal to put on the floor, your footage is gonna look amazing. Like I've reposted some footage recently on TikTok of myself using the Hero 4 with a gimbal. And it, on social media, honestly, when you're posting something in like 720p, it looks the exact same as the new GoPro. <laughs> So if someone's asking, they're not sure if they should join a mountain bike club or just focus on themselves. Um, I would say depends on the local scene you're in. Like where I live, personally, I would just be focusing on myself because most of the trails that the bike club are involved with are not trails that interest me. They're all like pretty beginner level. They're not building stuff that I like. And they really limit what you can and can't do. Whereas I can go to an unsanctioned area very easily and very safely here. And for example, I can go build on like First Nations land here with permission of like the chief or something. And that's one of the areas I'm building in now. And they're totally cool with mountain bikers, nothing sanctioned. It's all like kind of on that like gray area where it might get logged eventually, but no one cares that you're in there. And um, it's great because I'm just focusing on my own trails and on myself. But by, at the same time, get involved in a bike club at some level if you want to, because you're connecting with your community, like I'm saying. Attend trail days sometimes anyways, even if it's not exactly what you want to do. But you're getting yourself out in your community, you're networking, you're meeting more industry people, and you would be really surprised how small the mountain bike community is. Like there's so much, there's so much opportunity just to meet someone who's like one, de one degree of separation away from getting you a sponsor. One more thing. Um, not exactly a question, but Black Magic Design. DaVinci Resolve is a free platform for video editing. That's true. Like, so DaVinci Resolve is a really great one. I've used it before for basic video editing. It's really great. I do um, prefer Adobe Premiere, but it is like thirty dollars a month. So if you want a free platform that's like basically just as powerful, but a little more complex, get um, DaVinci Resolve. If you want to export in 4K, you have to pay for it. But if you're just doing social media posts like that, yeah, thanks for that, Michael. That's a really amazing, um, really amazing suggestion. All right, so that's all everyone's questions for now. And yeah, it's really cool you mentioned Black Magic because you can do some really cool color grading on there, like a lot more intense than what I'm doing. Okay, so if anyone has any more questions, you can post now. Otherwise, I'm gonna wrap it up because we're half an hour over and I gotta go build some trails. <laughs> and I'll try to do another one of these soon. And if you guys have any more questions on how to build roles, because I didn't go super in depth with that, I would love to really dive into like some of the more technical features of roles, like how to create your own custom URL, how to um, put in your own logo and all that stuff that really will make your role look super pro, but you're gonna need a premium account for it. But that I can really dive into those um, those features for you. All right, it looks like we have no more questions for now. There's 28 people left, a few of you left already. So thanks everyone who stuck it all the way through. It's been great having you. Thank you, Amy, for running another one of these with me. This has been awesome. And yeah, we'll get another one going really soon here. It's fun answering, answering everyone's questions. I hope this helped you with your athlete resumes. I'll remember to add at least folders to the existing one you're already in, so you can join easily and find it easily. And remember, just direct message me, leave comments on Bubble Up, wherever, email me, however you want to get a hold of me. I'm here to answer any of your questions anytime. Bye.